Welcome you to People's Church San Diego on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday. We want to welcome you and thank you for tuning in today. As we start, I just want to encourage you. Would you open your heart to God today? We know we're still quarantined, but it doesn't change the fact that God is right there in your home, in that living room and in that family room. So as we begin our time, I just want to encourage you, no matter what you're wearing, no matter what's going on, would you ask God honestly and say, God, speak to me in these next few minutes. Would you do that? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you today. And we know what you did in our lives last week during our Easter service you desire to do even much more today. We thank you because we sense your presence in our family, in that living room, God, in this living room, in this family room or den that we're watching this session. We thank you because we already sense you even now. And we thank you because your love knows no bounds. Your power knows no boundaries. You are able, you are willing and you are eager to touch us. You're eager to draw us close to you. And God, that's what we want today. We want to draw closer to you. We want to sense your presence. We want to experience more of you in our lives. So we pray, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We want to thank you for worshiping with us here at People's Church San Diego. And as we said, we're going on how many weeks now of quarantine? And we know that for the kids who are back in school, you know, spring break is over. Well, for most kids that are back in school, some kids are still on spring break. But this morning, we started a series last week and we're calling this series Fully Alive. And in just a couple of minutes, Pastor Phoebe will be coming and she's gonna be challenging you and I about the notion of what it does, what it, 
What does it really mean to be fully alive? What does it mean to live lives fully, completely, to the best? We're gonna find out in just a couple of minutes. But as we worship, would you encourage your family around you? And would you encourage yourself to really engage, not just with God's presence, but definitely with His Word? Thank you. Let's continue to worship.
People's Church Online. We pray that you are having a beautiful Sunday right there with your family. We've got a couple of things for you. First, we want to thank you for faithfully giving and supporting the church. Second, we partner with City Serve to provide household goods and items to families in need. If you know of any family that needs um, anything from pillows to runners to garbage disposals, we've got a few of them. Email us at info at peopleschurchsd.org. And last, our membership classes are going to be kicking in online. We want to let you know that it's coming up. Please check our website for schedules. We are so glad that you worship with us today. We pray for nothing less than God's best for you and your family. Have a beautiful week. Bye. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning here at People's Church. We're actually starting a new series called Fully Alive that we started last Easter. But this morning, I'm going to turn a little bit to the side. I'm not going to give my intro in the Fully Alive series, but I'd like to talk about this morning on how to find strength to go on in this crisis that we're going through. On February 26, 2020, the first case of suspected local transmission of the COVID COVID-19 happened in the United States. On March 13, President Trump declares U.S. a national emergency. Our country was brutally attacked and is still being attacked by the enemy, an enemy that we could not see. The unknown death toll of innocent Americans has already risen above 25, over 25,000 as of Wednesday. And our nation is still at war. As one doctor describes the environment in her hospital, he, she said, it's like being in, in a war zone. And it's not the kind of war that we're used to because in this war, the enemy is invisible. And anyone can be a target, anyone can be a carrier, and it can be anywhere. The coronavirus pandemic is putting words in the mouth of billions of people around the world. Words like ventilator, BPAP machine, face coverings, homemade masks, PPE, N95 masks, six feet social distancing. Where no, This is the first time in my life I heard that you have to sing happy birthday twice while washing your hands. Self-quarantine, self-isolation, the World Health Organization officially declared the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 a pandemic on March 11. The word pan, meaning which roughly tastes all, referring to a global nature of the spread affecting virtually every country and region around the world. Now these words are quickly becoming part of our daily terminology at home and in our daily life. As the COVID, as the, as the disease COVID-19, which now killed more than over a million, nearly close to two million people around the globe, continue to spread. Americans have a new fear that they haven't had in the past. The foundation of our sense of safety and security, the foundation of our economy, the foundation of our freedom, and for the families who have lost their loved ones, the foundation of their future, and, and the future of our country has been shaken to the core. Day after day, we hear stories, we read stories, and we see stories of family who have lost a patient, a parent who've lost a child, children who's lost their only parent, health professionals who are helping their patients end up being casualties themselves. I was just talking to someone said, someone told me earlier, there's a talk of opening the country and the economy soon. The question is, will Americans be able to get back to business as usual? And a normal kind of life after this unprecedented experience, we're all going through at this moment. There was a Gallup poll taken that says Americans today are more stressed, are more depressed, are worried, are discouraged, and fearful. Feeling more depressed since the outbreak. Feeling that they, can't, they, they have trouble concentrating and they're distracted. They have trouble sleeping and they're addicted to media coverage of the tragedy and of the outbreak. They're afraid to lose their jobs. They're afraid that they could be carrying the virus 
virus or, or that they, their, their loved ones are carrying the virus and they could infect each other. You see, folks, people are very devastated by what has happened. And they don't know how to get on with their lives and they don't know what to do next. I think we're all in the same boat. And to me, that's a good question. I think it's something that looms in the back of our mind. What do we do after we what do we do after we receive a major crisis in our life? What do we do when we're still in the crisis? How do we find the strength to go on in, in, a, in a time like this? People are saying, you know, we don't know if I have a job. We don't know how long this is going to happen. You see, folks, whether we like it or not, you and I are going to face tragedies in life. Life. That's just life. Life is a series of problem and crisis. We lose loved ones, we lose our health, we lose our property, we lose our jobs. The question is this, what do you do when someone was there one moment and then the next day they're gone or the next moment they're gone? How do you handle that kind of crisis? What do you do when you're planning on getting married and you break up the engagement and, <clears throat> and you have to tell everyone? Everybody that the engagement is broken off. What do you do when your spouse walks in the room and say, I'm leaving and I'm not coming back? What do you do when the doctor calls and say the diagnosis is terminal? I'm sorry. What do you do when you walk into your office and you've been handed a pink slip? How do you find strength to go on in this kind of crisis? Today we face a global crisis and the world is quietly in mourning and suffering and we're all coping in, two, in many, many different, way, different ways. Actually, there was a man in the Bible who was asked, who asked that question many years ago. How do I find the strength to go on? And his name is Jeremiah. Jeremiah went through one of the most horrendous period of history in his nation, Israel, when an enemy nation came in and ravaged the entire nation. In fact, it took the entire nation into captivity, right? And brought, took them out of their homeland and brought them into a foreign land. And during Jeremiah's lifetime, he watched enormous atrocities in humanity done to his own people, to his family, and to his country and to those he loved the most. And out of that experience, he wrote down all these emotions in two books of the Bible called the Book of Lamentation and the Book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah wrote what he lived and he lived what he wrote. And in the middle of a national tragedy where he had just lost all his countrymen, he wrote these words in the Book of Lamentation. And almost all the verse we're going to look at this morning is going to be taken from the Book of Lamentation. On top of your outline, read that with me he said this we have suffered major terror and pitfalls ruins and destruction streams of tears flow from my eyes because of the destruction of my people and then he says this I have cried until the tears no longer come my heart is broken my spirit pours uh, poured out as I see what was happening to my people I don't know how you felt when all this news are coming out that, that people were being put in, in, in body bags because there was not enough coffin and not enough mortuary to take care of them. Now, I, I believe we all have quietly dealing, are quietly dealing with this pain that we're facing. We've been under a lot of emotional tension the last couple of weeks, not knowing how long this virus is going to linger and last in the air, not knowing if it will be safe to even go out, not knowing if, if, if we're still going to have a job after all this. How do you keep going and how do you find the strength to go on during a crisis? In Jeremiah's case, God told him to do five things. What are we supposed to do in this kind of crisis? I believe this is very important. The first thing we need to do when we are overloaded with emotions is to tell God exactly how we feel. Just unload your feelings, pour it out. Every emotion that you've got, a crisis of a way of bringing all kinds of emotions in our lives that, that many of us sometimes haven't felt before. 
Let God hear it. Here's what Jeremiah said in Lamentations 2.19. He said, cry out in the night. Pour out your heart like water in prayer to the Lord. Just like you've got a pitcher of water and you're pouring it out in the glass. You can pour your heart out to God. Tell him all the emotions that are bottled up inside of you. I think one of the things that we face when we are in a crisis is we have all these emotions like fear, anxiety and depression and loneliness. The top poll, in a poll that was taken, it said that these are the top four emotions people are feeling at this moment. And those are legitimate emotions. The point is this, and many people do not realize this. Folks, I want to invite you to let it out and pour it out to God. Let me give you a little secret. God can handle our emotions. Say, Pastor Phoebe, even the negative? Yes, the negative emotions. He made you. He gave you those emotions and he can handle our anger, our doubt, our fear, our questions, our interrogation. He can handle our confusions, our grief. I love what Job said, how Job expressed his emotions to God in Job chapter 7 verse 11. In your outline, he said this to God. He said, God, I cannot be quiet. I am angry, I am bitter, and I have to speak. Now, I hope you get a chance as, as, you, as we end this session this morning. I hope that you get a chance this week to read the book of Job in the Bible this week. He tells God exactly how he feels. And he became brutally honest with God. Because in the first part of the book, he expresses his confusion. He said, God, why did you allow this to happen? And I think even Christians today, quietly we ask, God, why is this happening? And in the second part of the book of Job, he expresses his complaint, right? He said, I don't like what, I don't like God that you allow this to happen. And in the third part, he gives some outright bold accusation against God. He said, do you even know what you're doing, God? Are you really in charge? Are you really so loving? Are you really so great? Why can't you put a stop to this? Bold accusation against God. And folks, can I say this? If you know the story, God handled Job's emotion. God can handle your questions and your anger. In the middle of the COVID-19, in the middle of your personal crisis, there's a lot of emotions rushing in your heart. One patient expressed to me lately, said, Pastor, I have to stay strong for my kids. I cannot let them see me fall apart. I cannot express my fear and my anxiety to my kids. You see, folks, those, unex those unexpressed emotions are very toxic, not only to your health, but to the health of others. Those unexpressed emotions make us into a very ugly, bitter person inside. It distorts our perceptions of our crisis and our relationship. It depletes our mental reason and emotional strength to keep going in the midst of crisis. And that's the reason why it is very important to express those emotions. So I'd like to say this, when you face a tragedy and a crisis, and you will many times, we will many times, just be honest with God and tell him exactly how you feel. God, I am scared. God, I am afraid. You know what? We're going to do that right now. Would you join me in prayer? Would you just bow your heads where you are? I'd like to pray. Father, we know that you know us inside and out. And if this thing that is happening around us, God, is not a surprise to you. And Father, that in this moment, we have so many emotions. In these recent days, God, we, we feel afraid. There's confusion, there's anxiety, and there's depression. And we just honestly tell you this morning, today, God, that we do feel fear in our hearts. And we wonder, why is this happening? We have a lot of questions, God. We just confess to you our need of you. Our security and our sense of safety, God, has been shaken. And we honestly confess that those fear are overwhelming us right now. We just need you to know. We just need you to know and we need to vent that out to you, God. And we need to be reminded that you are still in control. So strengthen our hearts that we may know that you are at work among us in Jesus' name. 
Here's the second thing that Jeremiah did. He focused his attention on God. Now, there are many noises today. The news is constantly playing us and updating us as live coverage. And the point is we, we were bombarded with all this noise and we, we cannot keep our hearts still. Some of us are actually addicted to the news. Get alone with God. Be with him and just listen. Here's what Jeremiah said in Lamentation chapter 3. He said this, when life is heavy and hard to take, Go off by yourself, enter the silence, bow in prayer, and don't ask questions. Wait for hope to appear. I call this unplugging. Now, I don't know about you, but personally, I believe that we just got unplugged by force. COVID-19 has caused the entire world to slow down. Life is just getting faster and faster. Just think about it. Before COVID-19, we couldn't keep up anymore. As I was reflecting on this, <clears throat> as I shared last Sunday, I said, God, could it be possible that this is your way of just slowing us down? See, tragedies and crises have a way of refocusing our attention and they tend to focus us on the things that really matters in life, that really count, and the most important priorities in life. I was thinking since this outbreak happened, I had a lot of time to reflect. Now, I thought, wow, <clears throat> what a difference a virus makes, not only personally, but globally. Think about this. In December 2019, we were watching <clears throat> the COVID outbreak in China and Italy. By the, by the early part of February, we were watching COVID outbreak in America. Before COVID, people did not want to have anything to do with God. By the end of February, people started m mentioning God in their conversation, even on Facebook. Before COVID, people did not want to have anything to do with prayers. By the beginning of March, religious leaders have been calling their followers to pray and fast. The verse in 2 Chronicles 7.14 became a very visual uh, icon in social media. Before COVID-19, people were ashamed to even pray in public. By the beginning of April, people were praying everywhere, kneeling from the White House, in the hospital hallways, in the parking lot, in the street. It's never been seen before. Before COVID, people were too busy to go to church and listen to a 20-minute sermon. As of March 15, when our church doors were asked to close, computer windows, iPad screens, and telephone screens were open worldwide, and the virtual church has doubled or tripled their viewing audience. Before COVID-19, people emailed jokes to each other, but by March, they were emailing Bible verses and prayer. Before COVID, we were so focused on ourselves only beginning and the end of February, we started focusing on God. Many of you do not know this, but I was observing this. Overall, did you know that crime declined, declined after the pandemic struck? A trend playing globally, a city's report stunning crime drops in week since measures were put into place to slow down the spread of the virus. Get this, even, even among regions that have the highest level of violence outside the war zone, fewer people are being killed and fewer robberies are taking place. Folks, that's what crisis tends to do. It tends to refocus our attention. And I'd like to say this, that's not a bad thing, friends, because sometimes we're just so busy and we cannot hear God. We need to slow down. The third secret and the third steps that, that Jeremiah shows to us on finding strength to go on after a tragedy is to ask God to remove our fears. In tragedy, we feel all kinds of emotion, as we said already. We feel grief, we feel confusion, we feel doubt, we feel anger, we feel frustration. But there's one emotion that is more deadly and more damaging than all the other emotions. You know what it is? That's fear. See, grief does not paralyze you. Anger doesn't paralyze you. But fear does.
Jeremiah prayed this prayer in Lamentation chapter 3. From the bottom of the pit, and he is really in despair here. He said, I'm in the bottom of the pit. He cried out, he said, I cried out to you, O Lord, and when I beg you to listen to my cry, you heard me, and you answered me and told me not to be afraid. I don't care how you, who you are. People say, I am fearless. Everybody in this room has hidden fears. We may fake it. We may pretend like we don't have them. We may cover up all those fears. We may medicate them. But the truth is everybody has fears in life. It is a universal emotion. And there are a lot of things to fear. And there are plenty of things to fear in our lives. And you know it. Someone made a statement and said that some people will not die of COVID, but they'll die of fear. Fear is the initial feeling we get in sudden crisis, and that's normal. But what you do with that fear is crucial to your survival during a crisis. So if you're going to get on with your life, you've got to learn how to deal with the fear that you're quietly suffering inside. And the Bible gives us three antidotes to fear. First antidote is truth. Jesus said it like this, the truth will set you free. Now, you ask me, Pastor Reeve, how is that an antidote to fear? Because most fear are based on ignorance or false information. They're based, on, they're based not on the truth, but on lies that we have taken on in life. Misinterpretation, mis, misconception, misunderstanding, some prejudices, prejudices. That's where most fear comes from. Here's the bad news. A lot of the things we've learned in life aren't true. Things that you've learned about yourself, things that we learn about God, things that we learn about life, things that we learn about faith, experiencing in life, they're not just true. And that's why I always encourage people to say, take time to evaluate your belief system. Take time to ask the why question. Why do I believe this? Are there facts to prove what I believe? You have to replace the fear <clears throat> in your life with truth. And to me, folks, that's a choice. That's intentional. You put in the truth, and the truth will set you free. The second way you get rid of fear, according to Scripture, is, is by filling your life with God's love. Love. The Bible says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fears. You see, folks, crisis brings a lot of fear in our life. Uncertainty brings bigger fear. Death brings the biggest fear. And if you have a lot of fears in your life, it tells me one thing. You do not know God very well. I remember when I was a little girl, I used to be fearless. About until about seven years old, six years old. I would go to the room that's dark and I wouldn't be afraid. I remember the people who live with us would say, can you go to the room? And it was a dark room and I would walk in there. And then I got introduced to the Moo Moo. I guess here they call it, what, the boogeyman? Uh, in my culture, it's called the Moo Moo. After that, I never want to walk in a dark room. And I remember my dad was trying to reprogram this fear in my life, so he would tell me this, Phoebe, you don't have to fear because God is always with you. And I would answer my dad, my dad and say, yes, I know dad, but I can't see him. I can't see God. And my dad, trying to really help me get over that fear, he would say, go, Phoebe, go, go, go. I'm watching you. I'm mean, just go to that room, turn on the light. Just go, just walk in that hallway. I know it's dark, just go. I'm here, I'm watching you. And I remember as a child, when I would walk and look back at my dad, if my dad was watching. And as long as my dad was watching, I had no fear. Why? Because I am not afraid, because I know my dad. You see, when you fully understand the love that God has for you, you become fearless. You begin to understand that nothing happens in your life without Him being there. And I don't know about you, but that made a big deal in my life up to today. Love is always greater than fear. The third thing that we do is fear in our life is faith. Now, let me tell you how this works. Faith doesn't eliminate the feeling of fear. 
It gives you the courage to do what you need to do in spite of how you feel. That's what faith is. Faith did not say, okay, I'll take out the fear, then you will feel peace about it, and you can go. No. A lot of times, faith will say, I'll give you the courage, the power, and the energy, and the stamina to go ahead and do the very thing that you fear the most. To do the thing that you don't want to do because you're scared to death to do it. Faith is moving against your fear in spite of how you feel. It's like a shield against fear. Now the question is this, where do you get all that? Where do you get faith, love, and truth? What is the source of this three antidote of fear? I'll tell you what, a relationship with God. The more you get to know God, the more you're going to, to have his truth, his love, and his faith in your life. And I'm not just talking this about something that I've learned in theology, something that I've learned in the Bible. This is something I lived in my life daily. What I'm saying is this, all those fears that you've got in your life, the antidote, folks, is not a formula. The antidote is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. Folks, the better you get to understand and know him, the less fear you're going to have in your life. I love that verse in your Bible, in your outline, where it says, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me, freeing me from all my fears. The Lord, it says, we're, 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 the Lord frees me from all my fear. Where do you find truth, love, and faith? You find it in a God who loves you, who sent his only son for you. And the antidote to fear is not really a religion. It's not a formula. It is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Can I say this? God has brought some of you to this site this morning, in this session, so he could say to you, don't be afraid. Don't worry. Don't fret. Don't be anxious. Don't forget that I can help you out. And I want to help you out if you only allow me to. The fourth secret in finding strength to go on after a tragedy, and here's what Jeremiah had taught us, is to believe that God will restore you. Believe that God will restore you. Expect him to restore you. Trust him to restore you. Believe God can help you recover from the tragedy you've just gone through or you're still going through. You have to trust God to bring good out of the bad. Jeremiah did this after losing everything this is what he prayed in Lamentations chapter 5, verse 21. He said this, Restore us, O Lord, and bring us back to you again. I like that. I think my prayer is, God, restore us, O Lord, and don't bring us back to our pre corona life, God. But Lord, I pray that you bring us back to you again. Because I think you will agree with me that we have gone so far away from God. Maybe individually, but globally, right? We try to push God away. And, and Jeremiah said, God, restore us, God, but bring us back to you again. My prayer is that many of us today who are in people's church and many of us who are part of this community and those of you, those of you who are watching, I hope that your prayer is, a, is not saying, God, bring me back to my pre-corona life, but say, God, Thank you for allowing me to breathe again. Thank you for giving me to think about my life, to consider my life, to examine my life. And Lord, restore us, oh Lord, and bring us back. Bring me back, God, to you again. And look what he said. Give us back the joy we once had. Did you know that God specializes in new beginnings, folks? He helps people start over after a tragedy and crisis and bad things. I just want to warn you, though, as th this takes time. And a lot of people, sometimes I have conversations, I'm like, well, I asked God to help me, and God never helped me. I said, how long did you wait for God to, uh, to help you? Oh, one week. No, I'm sorry. It take, this takes time to recover from a tragedy. It's not, it's not going to happen overnight. It takes time to heal. It takes patience, and it takes trust for you to recover from any crisis and, and tragedy. And most people, like you and me, we can't wait to open. When are we going to open the country? When are we going to open the economy? We want things to be done quick. 
Notice the next verse in your outline in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25 and 26. It says there, would you read that with me, please? The Lord is good to everyone who trusts him. So it is best for us to what? It is best for us to wait in patience, to wait for him to save us. Would you circle that word, that statement, wait in patience? Why do we need to wait in patience? Because folks, can I tell you this? I mean, reality is it takes time to heal. It takes time to heal. And then fifth, the secret to recovering and finding strength to go on in spite of a tragedy. Here's what Jeremiah tells us. Remember what never changes. Folks, life is constantly changing. Crisis is a way of changing us, either for the better or for the bitter, right? And of course, a, tra a tragedy changes things even faster. And we will never be the same after this. Believe me, you will never be the same. Our children will never be the same. Things are never going back to the pre-COVID normal life that we have. One day, you're healthy. One visit to the doctor changes instantly. One minute, there's someone there who sleeps with you and loves you and, and, and walks through life with you. In a matter of a minute, they're gone and they're, they're done. How do you cope with those? When things are constantly changing, I want to remind you, folks, Jeremiah tells us, that you and I need to anchor ourselves to those certainties or you will never have stabilities in life. There are some things that never change. And he said, you, you have to nail yourself in these certainties. You need to anchor, you need to fasten yourself, you need to bolt yourself in these unchangeable realities or you're just going to be blown around by the circumstances in life. Folks, can I say this? Crisis brings uncertainties and instabilities and insecurities. You need to grab on something that is solid and that will not change. And Jeremiah did this. No matter what happens, there are three things that never change. And I think as we go through this, as we're still going through this, we need to remind ourselves, especially when uncertainty is coming and just being bombarded in our face and in our, in our minds, the news is telling us we don't no, someone. I was just talking to someone earlier and said, Pastor Fee, maybe they're going to open the country in the end of April, maybe in the last, the, the last day of April. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. But that's what they said to us before Easter, right? That's what they said. It's going to only be a 15-day quarantine or a three-week quarantine. And the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of things that are going to change. Jeremiah reminded us of three things that will never change, and we need to remember. First, he said this, remember that God is still in control. It's funny, because I hear this a lot in the conversation among Christians. Oh, don't worry, God is in control. Do you really know what that means? He's still on the throne. He still calls the shots in the world. And in spite of the crisis, in spite of the tragedy, humans do have a free will and we will make bad decisions and in those bad choices, people get hurt in the process. But folks, I wanna remind you, God controls how it will work out in the future. He doesn't control our choices. He lets us do and, 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 practice and, and, and live at our free choices and practice our free choice. But he does control how it all works out in the future. And we need to trust him on that. The truth is this. Some of us today are going through some crisis and you're thinking, I don't know how this is going to end. I don't know. I, I'm going under, Pastor Phoebe. The truth is this. I cannot handle everything that's going to happen in my life. But I don't have to because God will. The secret, folks, of crisis control is actually Christ's control. Let him handle it. Here's what Jeremiah says. 
He said, we are sick at our very hearts, and we can hardly see through our tears. But you, O oh Lord, but you, O oh Lord, are what? Are king forever. And I love this last part. And you will rule to the end of time. I like that. I like to remind myself, God, even if the world falls apart, you are in control. Here's the second thing that never changes and that we need to remember. And it is this, that God still loves me and he is never going to stop loving me can I say this when we go through a crisis other people might stop loving you other people might walk out on your life other people will say I'm done you're an ugly bitter person I don't ever want to be with you but can I say this? Look at what Jeremiah says. I love this verse. Would you read that with me? He said this, I'll never forget this trouble. The utter lostness, the taste of ashes, the poison I've swallowed. I remember it all, the feeling of hitting the bottom. But then he said this, but there is one thing I remember and remembering it, I keep a grip on hope. What is that he remember? God's loyal love couldn't have run out. His merciful love couldn't have dried up. They are created new every morning. Oh God, how great is your faithfulness. Folks, that is a true prayer we need to remember every day. He never stops loving us. A lot of people think when, when, when crisis happens that God is, just wants to get even with them. I, can, I, I, cannot, I cannot tell you the number of people who are online and, 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 and just vlogging and just talking and say, why, why can't God stop this? If he's a loving God, why would God allow this to happen? I mean, that's a different message. But is God getting even with us today? When, when we go through a crisis, the normal question, okay, God, what have I done? Am I getting even? Am I getting punished? Can I say this? If you think that way, you do not understand God at all. God did not cause coronavirus. And God will not cause any problem or will not cause any accidents in your life. But I'd like to say this. In spite of all these things that are happening, God will never stop loving us. He is God. And the third thing you need to remember, as Jeremiah would like to, to remind us, there are things that will not change. It is this. And the third one is that God is all I need. God is all you need. God is all we need. You're never going to know that God is all you've got until God is all, that God is all you need, until God is all you've got. People are constantly going to leave your life, either by death or separation or relocation. So there will probably be a time in your life when you're going to be alone and you're going to say, oh my gosh, everyone's leaving me, all my children are leaving me. Oh, it's okay. Because there's always a God who promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you. You're going to find out that one of these days that God is all you've got. If you've got God, you've got everything else and you need God because he's got all the resources he has for you. What people do not realize is this God that we pray to, this God who sent his son, loves you more than anything in this world. I love what Jeremiah says. He said this, deep in my heart I say, the Lord is all I need, and I can still depend on him. Folks, you don't have to know all the answer if you know who God is. Because God has the answer for your life. But you need to get connected to God. I'd like to pray for you. Let's bow our head just where you are, in your bedroom, I don't know. And if you're with other people, would you... Would you just make this moment to be a time where you can just pray and just be silent and respect this. I call this your God moment. After you've heard the message, maybe you're, cause that's me, that's me. Oh God, that's me. I have a lot of fear. God, I, I just feel like I can't go on anymore. Can I pray for you, for you? So would you bow your heads? Father, I know you are in homes right now you are 
in bedrooms, in living room, dining room. You're even in the garden. You're at work. You're in your car. And Lord, I pray in this moment that you would allow them to have this connection with you. Father, there are many people here who are tired. And I'm sure are feeling overloaded from the emotional stress and maybe even the financial stress, God, of the past three months. And there are people here today watching online who are down, who are low, who are depressed. There are some who are worried. And God, there are many who are grieving the loss of their loved ones. Many are fearful, God, and many of us are just living with anxiety. And I believe, God, that's why you brought us all together all around the world. You, Lord, have the emotional and spiritual and physical strength that we need to go on with our lives in the midst of this crisis. So, Jesus Christ, we look to you. And I pray that right now in this moment, many people would open their hearts to you and their lives to you for comfort, for guidance and help. If you have never opened your life to Jesus Christ, if you have never opened your life to God, and I'm not talking about you don't know who they are, you don't know, you know Jesus Christ, you know who God is. And somehow in the back of your mind, there's, there's this belief system that there's a higher power. But if you have never opened your life to God, or at least you don't remember opening your life and receiving God's gift of life through Jesus Christ, would you pray this prayer in your heart with me? Not, not, not just because my prayer is the best now. If you want to pray on your own, that's fine. But I want to lead those who just kind of like, I just need help. I've never prayed before. I've never done this. Follow me just where you are. Just in the quietness, say this, God, I need this life that you are offering me. I need a truth to believe in. I need your unconditional love. And I need the faith to believe in you. Forgive me, God, for ignoring you in the past. So today, I open my heart to you and I accept you. I accept you as the answer to my need today. Jesus Christ, I ask you to be the new owner of my life. I ask you to take over my life and give me the strength to go on. God, thank you. And I receive this life today in Jesus' name. God, would you heal those painful memories, those painful experiences that many of us are carrying today? Many of today, God, are, are facing this global crisis, but Lord, there's individuals today watching this who are going through personal crisis of themselves and they're thinking, God, I just can't go on anymore. This is way too heavy for me. I'd like to invite you to pray this prayer quietly in your heart. Say this, dear God, I need your strength in my life. Thank you for allowing me to connect today with this community. This week, God, I want to begin taking this step. Help me to express my feelings to you. Help me to slow down and take the time to refocus my attention on you, God. I want to make that a priority this week. I want to spend the next five, ten minutes every day just refocusing on you, God, focusing on you. God, help me to start building my life around you, around your truth, around your love and your faith, so I can be released from the fears and the worries that I struggle with on a daily basis. God, I believe you can and want to help me through this crisis in my life. So help me, God, to focus on what you have left me in my hands, not on what I lost. And most of all, Jesus Christ, 
Help me to remember that you are in control, that you love me, and you are all I need. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I would like to say thank you again for everyone who are faithfully supporting People's Church through your giving and through your offering. Thank you so much. We really appreciate people had been sending it through email, through their, through their mail, through online and through text. And I'd like to say from the bottom of my heart, you are a very generous community. Thank you so much for loving God and loving people. Would you join me in prayer right now as we take this moment to worship God with our giving? God, we thank you. Thank you for our life. And we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us, God, to be alive in the middle of a crisis. And Lord, although it's difficult, we still thank you for what we have. And we are grateful, God, for what you're about to do in our life this coming week. We would like to take our moment, this moment, God, to just say thank you for our jobs. For those of us who had jobs, thank you, God. And for those, God, who, who have lost their job or they're in forlow, God, would you remind them that you will be their provider. Help them to have the faith to trust you, God, in this difficult moment. So God, we just, out of, the, out of the worship of our heart and our love, we just want to return to you a portion of what you have so richly blessed us. Here it is, God. We give our life to you, and we give it in love and in true worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
take what the enemy meant for evil And you turned it for good You turned it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turned it for good You turned it for good Oh, oh, oh. You take what the enemy meant for evil Turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, you take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle. Thank you for worshiping with us here today at People's Church San Diego. And as we close, you know, we want to let you know we are praying for you. And we know we miss this last part of the session together when we get to pray for each other. So here's what I'd like to ask you to do. Right there in your home, would you join hands with your family? And I know that might be a little weird because usually we do that here at church. We join hands and we pray for one another. But since we're not here and since you're at home with your family, would you take this time? Would you join hands? It's okay to join hands. And as we take this time to pray, I know you're together at home, you're quarantined together at home, but would you just take this time right now? You don't need to ask them, well, would you pray for the person that you're the hand that you're holding on your right and on your left, would you do that for a few minutes? Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, as we come to the close of our session we thank you for speaking to us thank you for your word that is real and it's powerful continuing to transform us from the inside out Lord we pray continue to let your word move in us transform us transform our attitude and our character to be more like you Jesus and God we pray as we face this new week, Lord, we ask for your strength. We ask for the power of your presence every day, every minute, every hour. 
And Lord, we continue to lift up to you family and friends that are recovering from this virus. And God, we will not stop believing. We will not stop praying because we know you are working. You are restoring people's health. And God, we thank you for the wonderful news that we have from people in our family, church family and our friends. God, that are now recovering from this virus. We thank you. We pray continue to strengthen their bodies, continue to heal their cells, continue allow to allow that their immune system to get stronger and stronger. Strengthen their lungs, God. Allow their lungs to breathe again. Allow their body, God, to get back to normal. We continue to pray for the doctors and the nurses and all the medical professionals that are taking care of our family and friends and our loved ones. Continue to protect them and be with them. And Lord, as we face this week, we know that we're not alone. We know that we may be quarantined and we may feel alone, but we know we are not alone because we belong to a church family, God. Although right now we can't be together, we know that there are hundreds of people worshiping with us, thinking about us and praying for us. And God, as we pray for our family and the those in our household continue to do your work in us, continue to help us as we pursue living lives fully alive. And God, we're so excited for what you're going to be doing this week until we see each other again next week. And Lord, we pray, be with us as you always are and help us never forget that no matter what happens and no matter where we go, you are with us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. We love you guys. We are praying for you. God bless.